All right, so good afternoon, everyone. I hope my voice projects well then. Uh, good. Uh, so today we're going to be presenting to you a, uh, a project that we worked on with our industrial partner, Applied Lubrication Technology, uh, to develop a stable anti-wear lubricant additive uh, called MOLO. So just to give you a brief outline of what we're going to talk about today, we're going to first introduce the topic as well as then motivate the need for a lubricating concentrate. And we're going to be talking about the existing approaches as well as their challenges, and then go into some of the objectives that we set out to accomplish and the design that we created in order to accomplish those objectives. Then we're going to be talking about some of the important stability and performance results that we came across, and we, and we did. And then we're going to lastly wrap up by talking about design trade-offs, cost analysis, as well as conclusions, and then future work. So as you may be, as you may be aware, lubricants play a major role in protecting, protecting surfaces from wear. Uh, and this effect is particularly important in mechanical components such as uh, conveyor chains as well, as well as ball bearings. In fact, the largest cause of bearing failure is due to poor lubrication. Uh, this leads to wear, equipment downtime, as well as high undesired wear costs, repair costs. Uh, and what happens in order to combat these problems in the field is that people use high performance lubricants. But oftentimes these lubricants are made from specially formulated concentrates. But there's a problem with those concentrates. So companies try to make use of particulates such as molybdenum disulfide or graphite and disperse them in oil uh, in order to create these uh, concentrates that will be used in lubricants. But the issue with that is it's difficult to stabilize and effectively disperse these particles in oil carriers. So as you can see in the figure, a, con a normal unstable concentrate will undergo aggl agglomeration and phase separation, uh, leading to an un uneven distribution of the lubricating additive particles within the concentrate. Uh, as well as eventually in the lubricant, therefore leading to a poor lubricating behavior. So what we set out to do is create a concentrate that has a high loading of MOS2 particles within the range of 5 to 30 weight percent. Uh, now this particular range was actually chosen based off uh, the specific needs of our uh, industrial partner applied lubrication technology. Uh, and while doing so, we wanted to have a long shelf life of several days without agglomeration. And having all that, we of course then want our lubricant to perform very well, even when used in small amounts. Uh, and it should synergize with other performance enhancing additives as well. So now that we know the objectives that we set out to accomplish, we'll talk about the design that we came up with, as well as briefly go into the mechanisms that we used uh, uh, that are in theory should prove that our product should work. Uh, so our approach is to use uh, MOS2 particles and disperse them in an oil carrier. We want to stabilize these MOS2 particles, uh, both chemically as well as physically, and this will produce our stable anti-wear concentrate. We will then carry this concentrate forward uh, into a lubricant, where we then can incorporate other performance-enhancing additives, including one that we synthesize ourselves, uh, and uh, called the product ionic liquid, which Sebastian will now uh, describe in detail for you. OK, so the base of our concentrate is a paraffinic base oil. To this, we add our molybdenum disulfide, which is our anti-wear additive. We add this at varying amounts depending on which product we're going to make. So we have a 5 weight percent product, known as MOLO5, and a 30 weight percent product of MOLO30. The weight percent is based on the MOS2 loading. So to stabilize this, we add a non-ionic surfactant, as well as a polymer to increase the viscosity and stabilize the product further. Now, all these components come together to form, to form the product that we call MOLO. So when this product is actually used, it's going to be diluted into a lubricant. Now, it's going to be diluted alongside our protic ionic liquid, or PIL for short. This is a charged, oil-soluble, organic compound that we synthesize ourselves to further reduce the wear on our product. So it's mixed with MOLO at different amounts, depending on which product is used. If MOLO5 is used, 6% of the final lubricant will be MOLO5, whereas if MOLO30 is used, only 1%. This way, the final lubricant will have the exact same amount of MOS2 in it. We can mix this with other performing enhancing additives to increase the versatility of the lubricant, such as corrosion resistance and particles. So how do we actually stabilize it? Well, this is done in two means, chemically and physically. For chemically, we have the surfactant bind to the surface of the MOS2 particles. So their tails stick out towards each other and experience steric repulsion, preventing the particles from agglomerating further. Now we use viscosity, the polymer, to improve the thickness of the concentrate, such that when gravity acts on it, the gravitational force naturally wants to have it settle to the bottom, 
but the thickness prevents that from doing so by increasing the drag force. Thus, the product should have a longer shelf life. So, with this, we'll discuss how the product lubricates. So, for the MOS2 particles, their sheet like structures adhere parallel to the metal surfaces as shown in the figure. So, this allows such that when the metal surfaces slide, the intermolecular forces that would hold the MOS2 sheets together are able to be sheared easily and have them separate so the wear is on the sheets instead of the metal surfaces. Now, for the PIL, the PIL heads bind to the surface of the metal sheets and have their tails stick outwards. This increases the surface separation between the two sheets of metal, thus preventing them from wearing against each other and also lowering the coefficient of friction. So now we know how uh, the product should be stabilized in theory. We can then talk about what tests we did to confirm this. Uh, so we did FTR in order to check for the functionalization. Uh, and so what we did is we did FTR on two samples, our surfactant on its own, as well as our surfactant with MOS2. Uh, so what you can see here uh, are these, in these spectra are these chemical groups that are associated with each peak. And we can use this to determine if uh, our product is actually functionalized correctly. So if you look at the surfactant spectra in green, uh, you can see that there's a large peak in the purple region, and that's associated with the OH groups in the polar head of our surfactant. Now when we add MOS2, this, polar, uh, this peak actually disappears, therefore indicating a strong interaction with our MOS2 particles. And then we do a visual inspection of our product, which is the molo concentrate. And uh, you can see that it's a dark uh, liquid that with high viscosity. And what's interesting about this photo is that we took it after several weeks. And it still appears to uh, show uniform consistency with minimal agglomeration. And then we can look at the product under a optical microscope. So we can look at what you see over there is our molo 5 sample uh, that's not been diluted. So in order to get a, a better idea of how these particles are, we diluted the sample and took a higher magnification image. And you can see that the particles are still well dispersed with minimal agglomeration. And this is after three days of synthesis. And then we can also check the long-term stability. And in order to do this, we do dynamic light scattering. This gives us an indication of the particle size as well as the functionality, uh, therefore the overall stability. So what we want is our particle sizes to remain stable and constant over time. So we can increase the shelf life of this concentrate. So what you can tell is that both MOLO 5 and MOLO 30 after six days have similar particle sizes to that of their initial day uh, upon synthesis. And even after 44 days, the particle sizes are around the same. And all sizes that we, we've shown here are still within the particle ranges that we want in order to incorporate into a lubricant. Now that Harad has proved the stability of our product, I'll discuss how it performs when mixed in with a lubricant. So we tested it using a twist compression tester. So what this does is you have a steel plate, you lubricate the steel plate and have a cylindrical die as shown in the figure. This die is lowered onto the plate and then rotated at a set speed for a specific distance. So what this does is create the wear on a plate and the coefficient of friction is measured constantly throughout the entire process. We use the parameters of a 10 megapascals pressure of the die onto the plate and a rotational speed of 10 millimeters per second as this reflects which is normally, in a, normally used in some factory settings. So from this, we looked at the performance of our various products. So for MOLO5, we compared it to a reference lubricant with no additives of MOS2 or PIL to a concentrate shown in orange, which is a, based off of a competitor's concentrate that uses 35% MOS2, similar to our MOLO30 product, as well as MOLO5 concentrate in oil, as well as MOLO5 plus the PIL in the lubricant. So what we can see here is that there's a 15% reduction of the coefficient, coefficient of friction, putting it on par with the competitor, which is good. Also, proving that it's very valuable as a high performance lubricant. In this situation, we didn't notice an increase of the coefficient of friction with the PIL. This is likely due to the fact that the concentration for model 5 is higher than the PIL in the final lubricant, meaning that the PIL cannot compete properly and not do its job sufficiently. So for the Mall 30 product, we again did a similar comparison with the reference shown in black, competitor orange, our product Mall 30 blue, and with PIL in purple. In this case, there was a 10% reduction of coefficient of friction, which again was fairly close to the competitor and showing that it's viable for use in a high performance lubrication. 
However, it's important to note in this case that the PIL was able to further reduce the coefficient of friction and was able to synergize properly with the MOS2, as it is very apparent in the beginning section where the purple line is significantly lower than the rest in low sliding distances. So after we were done these tests, we looked at the steel plate that the die was pressing against to measure the wear scars. We looked at it visually as well as under optimal microscopy at 10 times magnification. So, the top plate is a plate that used a MOLO5 as a lubricant, whereas the bottom was a reference. You see in this bottom, there's a lot of horizontal scrapings where the die was able to mash against the plate and wear it down. Whereas in our sample, there are almost no horizontal scrapings, just the rough unevenness of the natural metal surface that's there, showing it was able to pervert, preserve that state. This goes to show that our product was able to reduce the coefficient of friction, as well as reduce wear, saving your machine's lifetime. So some of the trade-offs we came with throughout our design was that between the cost and the anti-wear performance. So to increase the anti-wear performance, you'd increase the MOS2 loading, because that's your anti-wear particles. However, that becomes more expensive. To another trade-off would be between processing and MOS2 loading. The higher MOS2 we have, the more thicker and viscous the solution becomes, meaning it's a lot more difficult to work with and synthesize, such that it's harder to process. So there's a balance to reach between those two. Thirdly, there's the balance between stability and lubricating mechanism. If the surfactant we use to stabilize our MOS2 particle binds too tightly, the lubricating mechanism of the MOS2 is decreased. So it's not as efficient in lubricating as it could be. So there needs to be a balance between those two products. And with any design engineering thing, we looked at the cost analysis to see the economics of a product. So we looked at the cost uh, per liter to make, so cost per liter to make our product. For the Molo 5, it costs about $11 per liter to make based on the materials. Similarly, the Molo 30 costs about 65 because there's more MOS2 in it. Both of these have the majority of the cost being the MOS2 particles themselves. We also looked at a Lalamine, which costs about $179 to make. These costs may seem expensive. However, I'd like to remind you that they're going to be diluted significantly when using a lubricant, as well as these costs were based on a lab scale quantities. So when actually made in bulk for manufacturing, their costs can be significantly reduced even further. And so that's all the analysis we have for you. We can now summarize what we've accomplished. So what we've done so far is create a successful concentrate that has a high loading of MOS2 particles, and while doing so, it's able to have a long shelf life, and we show stability of that concentrate. Uh, we can also show that we uh, have a significant reduction uh, in friction, uh, as well as we can improve performance with our concentrate. We also showed that the PIL that we formed has a potential to synergize with MOLO to even further increase performance. But there's still some work that we can, we can still do. Uh, and that includes uh, doing some testing at higher temperatures with MOLO, as well as looking, uh, looking at the MOS2 particle size and reducing that and seeing its effect on uh, the performance. And in order to get MOLO commercialized, of course, then we have to pass some standardized testing, uh, such as the ones that ASTM has. Uh, with that, I thank you, and we can now open up the floor to any questions. Very nice, very clear. I like it. Thank you. Can you go to slide 18? Slide 18? One of your conclusions says that we have a higher performance, and they got that when you said we get 15 percent improvement when yes. you looked at this slide. Yes. I don't see it. 15 percent. So you look at the reference, which is the uh, lubricant without. Well, the, the question is how I look at this graphic and, yeah. they, and get a measurement that is 15 percent better. So how do we do that? We essentially compared the uh, black line with the uh, blue line product, as in like an average of the whole thing, and judge that the coefficient of friction value there was reduced by 15%. So it's hard to um, portray as in like, and this graph doesn't show it as a set number easily, but it's designed to show that there's lubricating performance dynamics changes over the time. Did you eyeball this 15% or did you put this into a software and you did some calculations? We took some averages on it, yeah. So is there a specific point that you need that is more relevant, like the onset or the that is more relevant to calculate this performance? So it's nice to have the end performance very well because that shows over time the, your, how your product stabilities, not how, how your product lubricants over long, of low, uh, long loading, whereas you can see for the Molo 5 is below all the rest, so that shows that our product is very good, whereas the uh, reference sample escalates higher than the others and similar, similarly with the uh, competitor. And the 
I don't know if I should expand on it some more. Uh, so the reason that we, we look at that end section is that it's based this, why is there oscillations, you might ask as well. So that's a yeah. good, yeah. That, okay, good question. Um, it's also because of the way the testing is. So if you can show the twist wire compression testing. I'm not, I'm not very interested in why it mm -hmm. has noise, but why it goes down, it e goes up. It exactly. Goes down. So that's what I'll explain. So that's inherent to the machine that we're using, which is a twist compression testing machine. And so that initial decrease, yeah, you have the GIF over there. So the way that this machine works is that you have this initial contact, and that's that slight then decrease in the coefficient of friction, and that's because the lubricating particles are starting to begin to work. So that's when the die is not being pressed down and it's starting to apply the pressure. But as it's, being, as it's applying pressure, it's trying to reach that pressure that we set it to reach, which in this case was a 10 megapascals. Uh, while it's doing that, it's increasing the torque, and that increases the coefficient of friction until it reaches that point. Uh, and while it's doing so, it's uh, spreading out that lubricating particles, and then that's why you have this then, the particles working, and then decreasing the coefficient of friction again. Until you reach a point where then your lubricating behavior then be, starts to increase back up again, and this should just keep shooting up, and the coefficient of friction should increase based on the t this type of testing. So it's inherent to the testing. Where do we use this instrument? This is an instrument, uh, this is twist compression testing. It's an E3 in the manufacturing processing labs in e engineering three. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a standard machine that's used in the field. It's not the type of testing that you would do in order to commercialize a product, in order to commercialize, like say, a lubricant product. Yeah. You, you just uh, take, you extract the uh, same milliliter amount that you then apply onto the, the, the steel plate, and then you How put it. Is it the, the wet that everywhere? So, the yeah, the surface is cleaned beforehand with like acetone and chemicals to make sure it's all uniform and good comparison to other samples to make sure there's not that difference between samples. So, you make sure. So, then we clean the surface first. How to make sure? Yeah, um, to make sure we do multiple tests further and further again, but we only had so much time with the machine, so we did a few amount of tests just to demonstrate the limited amount of yeah, tests we can do. This is standard technique for the friction Yeah, this is fairly standard. Is quite standard. In order to commercialize a product, there are other tests that are done, uh, such as pin and V-block, as well as a four-ball wear test, but due to time constraints, we couldn't get access to those. We're actually arranging to have our samples be sent up to the United States to get tested uh, with the company that we're working with. Uh, I believe it's the United States or wherever it is. And they're going to test. Yeah. Okay, do you have the ionic liquid here for duration? Uh, the, the no, the protonic liquid, that was added um, directly. So when you mix the concentrate in, you would add the protonic ionic liquid then. Which ionic liquid do you need? We used, oh, we used, uh, we synthesized it, nonoic acid and olelamine. Uh, no, olelamine, okay. octolamine. Okay. Thank you.